The balance of power is on their side. Wrestling it away and putting that power back in the hands of the people is the first priority. Sure, just not in the way that socialists think. Hello, Internets. There is unfortunately a very common grift that BreadTube or often just socialists in general will often pull to try and trick people into thinking that socialism has all the answers. First, they will identify a problem with society, and to this end, they will often do a pretty good job of explaining the issue at length, and often do identify actual issues. Two, they will then blame capitalism for the problem, usually without any decent evidence, and often failing to demonstrate any understanding of how markets and incentives actually operate. And three, they will then try to sell you socialism as the solution, again, without any real evidence. They will then find another problem and repeat this process endlessly. Out of all the grifts that socialists pull, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, is the idea that socialism provides any kind of reasonable solution to the problems of government corruption. Issues like lobbying, where large corporations pay for the government for favors, or the revolving door where politicians often work for the private sector that lobbied them as soon as their term is up, and the big guys just get to keep dumpstering on the little guy. That, if we just had socialism and more free stuff and more workplace democracy, all of these issues would just magically go away. In this video, I'm going to show why socialism is not only a false cure to the corruption problem, but is the illogical equivalent of pouring gasoline on a fire, and is probably one of the biggest examples of people who agree with everything the establishment and the cathedral says, pretending like they are somehow anti-establishment. And the best way to showcase this is for this to be yet another video in my Refuting BreadTube series, this time focused on Second Thought, who has released a hefty amount of content that is guilty of this three-point grift I just went over. Which is unfortunate because Second Thought, like I mentioned, does a relatively decent job explaining what the problem is, and he often does make a few good points. So in the clips I'm about to show you, a lot of what he says about the United States government, specifically Washington DC's misconduct, is relatively correct up until the point where he tries to identify the cause as capitalism and the free market and propose a solution of socialism, which is pretty much where the errors in his videos start. So this will be a unique sort of response video in that I'm not disagreeing with every word he says, but rather adding context so that people can better understand the issue at hand and why socialism is not the cure to the state disease. So it's now time to dive into just what he has to say. I won't be showing his videos in their entirety, it's not really necessary, just enough to understand his main points. Links to the full videos will be in the description below. Many congresspeople see their wealth grow by thousands of percentage points after they're elected, and the majority of our federal lawmakers are full-on millionaires. So where does all this money come from? What is investment? Using Nancy's public records, researchers at Open Secrets found that in 2018 she invested $46.5 million in real estate, another $15.8 million in electronics manufacturing, and a cool $15 million into just Apple. You might remember these four from the start of the pandemic. In February, this one wrote this article, where he says the US is better prepared than ever before to face emerging public health threats. But then a week later, he did this. Weird. Well, not really. Before the rest of us knew how bad COVID would get, but after internal briefings by the CDC and Fauci on the severity of the upcoming pandemic, these four senators dumped a whole bunch of money they held in the stock market right as it was about to crash. They all made hundreds of thousands of dollars, presumably using information not disclosed to the public. So a lot of what Second Thought just said was, for the most part, correct. In fact, if anything, the situation is worse than how he paints it. But this is in serious need of some context, because as it turns out, the fact that some politicians are able to get rich off investments is really just one small part of the problems going on in Washington. And it should also be pointed out that just people being rich in general isn't necessarily a problem in its own. We don't want to get into the fixed pie fallacy here. So first off, it's important to point out that Open Secrets is a resource I have used before myself and it's less of a study than it is a dump of publicly available transactions in the US federal government. And it contains a lot of data. Major companies spend millions of dollars in order to give themselves a bigger voice. Both Republicans and Democrats partake, with some companies spending more on specific parties. For the most part, there is nothing really wrong with the first half of Second Thought's video here, save for one key detail that he has left out, which is that the big reason politicians can get rich off investing is the fact that the United States government has wide-reaching regulatory 
their power over the economy, save for few restrictions by the constitution and various other constituents. This is why they have access to so much insider information that lets them partake in insider trading. Because they have a lot of effective power over businesses and organizations, they can just order them to provide them with the data they need to make these investments. But the real kicker is the fact that they have this regulatory control, and their access to inside information is more or less just a side effect to this true cause. And if we apply some basic economic literacy, this is pretty darn obvious when you think about it. The ability to regulate the market is equivalent to the ability to pick winners and losers in that market, since they can just regulate in a way that guarantees their favorite party to win. So obviously, a person in a position of power that lets them choose which business can succeed will have no problems investing in the businesses that will return them a profit, because when they have this regulatory control, they can just force their thumbs down on the regulatory scales, making it so the business they invested in is practically guaranteed to win the rat race. And of course, they usually choose larger corporations because those are the ones that can afford to lobby and can afford to offer cushy, high-paying, revolving door jobs. In addition to being something that can be just understood rationally, which is basic reason, there's also a good deal of studies showing this to be a big problem with Washington and regulation. For instance, the impact of regulatory costs on small firms. In the study, they found that the hammer of government regulation is much harder on smaller businesses than on larger businesses. Specifically, they found that the regulatory costs on small firms was about 36% higher than on large firms. But even if the average cost per employee was the same, or even slightly less, between business sizes, it would still represent a huge problem in the market. These regulations are creating artificial fixed costs. A startup firm has a much harder barrier to entry versus a large corporation that can just pay the costs outright. This is the big reason why you can't so easily start your own business in order to own the production of your own labor. If you actually do research into what it takes to start a small business, you'll find a very long list of ridiculous fees that must be paid. For example, say you want to open a restaurant. There are dozens of fees and government mandated permits you must pay and apply for to do so. These permits are complex, time consuming, and can cost thousands of dollars. In addition to the time and any lawyer fees you must also pay to navigate this maze of legality and permits, the process can sometimes take months, sometimes years to complete. Do you have roughly 10 grand to pay the state and a year of free time to deal with this unnecessary bureaucracy to start a business? If you are like most people, probably not. The average American does not have that kind of money and free time laying around. So if you want to talk about stepping on the little guy, look no further than the regulations the state passes, often with the blessing of large corporations who know full well exactly what they are doing. And yes, the state works with their lobbyists to do this on purpose. We know it's on purpose because the system provides them a very perverse incentive to do so, as this allows state representatives to make bank and get rich off the return. And of course, corporations that can afford the cost of this indirect form of bribery also have an incentive to pay those costs because it is more profitable. This is why big business and Wall Street are so involved in Washington, because if pumping money into Congress results in less competition and greater return for themselves, they're basically forced to do so or else they risk losing in the market to a business that did, if it's so profitable. Which then brings up the question, why does Second Thought omit this little tidbit of information about how it's mainly regulations that are being designed intentionally destroying small business when talking about state representatives making money off investing? Well, that reason can be found in this little clip. And if you look at a 2017 report by Public Citizen about senators and stock trading, you'll find that many individual senators often trade stocks in businesses that they oversee in their official capacity. I'm no expert, but this might be a problem, no? Ah, what do I know? I should just listen to people like Pelosi, who always know what to say and have the best explanations for why this isn't a problem. Truly airtight arguments. Because this is a free market. Makes sense to me. Everybody say thank you to Mrs. Pelosi for that valuable lesson in economics. But fine. Ah yes, of course, because he intends to blame the free market itself, not the people who use the aggressive force of the state to rig it with regulation. Now, to understand why this doesn't make any sense, we must go over two terms. First off is, what is a free market? Well, it's an economic system dictated by supply and demand determining the price of goods and services, free of government or other authoritarian intervention. And then we have a neoliberal mixed market, which is a regulated market where the price of some goods and services are dictated by consumer demand, but with some aspects of the economy dictated by government intervention and regulation. 
Just about every developed nation post-World War II era, from East Asia to Europe to the Americas, follows the neoliberal world order. Almost no one who studies economics seriously denies this, as it is practiced openly and with full support of major global organizations. We effectively live in a neoliberal society. If you are watching this video right now, you most likely live in a neoliberal country that most likely follows a neoliberal mixed market of some sort, which has some aspects of social programs and some aspects of tax taxation and regulation mixed in with a sort of quasi-free market. It is a much more complex problem other than just saying a free market. This means that economic issues cannot be understood as simply capitalism is when bad stuff, which is basically the argument that is being implied here by second thought. That's an example of an outcome bias fallacy. To truly understand what is at fault in a mixed market, you have to examine the process that led to the economic outcome, not just make blind assumptions based on outcome alone, because again, in a mixed market, the causes of problems can be varied. So let's look at the process that led to Nancy Pelosi's wealth. Can this be blamed on the free market, or can it be blamed on regulation and the fact that we live in a neoliberal mixed market? Well, when you look at the facts, it's clear that her it's a free market excuse is clearly a lie, and Nancy Pelosi probably knows that it's a lie. Nancy Pelosi earns her wealth by the process created by the fact that she is in a position of power that has regulatory control and access to confidential information fully backed up by the authoritarian force of government power and intervention. So to imply that we must get rid of the free market aspects of the neoliberal mixed market to solve this problem is a complete non sequitur that completely fails to identify where the issue is coming from. As in this specific example, the wealth of these politicians is coming from the fact that they have regulatory control. What Second Thought is saying here makes about as much sense as saying that an online video game is bad because you encountered a hacker. Just because there are cheaters doesn't make something bad. It just means it would need better anti-cheat protection. Imagine if game devs followed this train of thought to its logical conclusion and shut their servers down every time there was a hack instead of just releasing a security patch through stream or whatever to help mitigate the hack. That's obviously crazy, but it's also exactly the reasoning behind what bread tubers are telling you when they say that we need to do socialism in order to fix cronyism. In fact, if anything, it is much worse than that, and I'll be explaining why towards the end of this video. Later, Second Thought even cites a study that somewhat proves this. Well, one study estimates that every dollar spent on lobbying returns an average of $760. If that number seems a little high to you, and it might very well be, regardless of what the actual amount is, it will always be more than what's put in. Businesses wouldn't lobby if it didn't serve them. Yes indeed, when it is more profitable for business to buy favors from the government than to actually provide goods and services that people actually want, they will buy favors from the government. This is a no-brainer. The Mises Institute puts this into fairly straightforward context in an article from Antony Samaroff. He writes, there's a problem with thinking the government can ever enter the economy as a fair referee rather than merely playing into the hands of whatever factions are most rich, powerful, and influential. Because as soon as a corporation can make more money by angling for government favors than they can by serving customers, that is exactly what they are going to do. Not necessarily because they are evil, but because it becomes the rational thing to do. On an open market, where only voluntary exchanges are permitted, a business can only turn a profit by providing something that the general buying public wants. Also, the study by Sunlight Foundation that Second Thought is citing also somewhat delves into this and explains the issue of government as a business partner and how the returns are far higher than what it is put into it. But again, the process that leads to this can all again be traced to the government intervention, an issue of the regulatory side of a mixed market. Businesses are simply buying what the government is selling. So what solution does Second Thought propose to this? Well, as you can probably guess, socialism. And he recently released a new video that details this much more directly than what he did with his video about politicians getting rich. This is in his video on why the US is not a democracy. Like any political concept though, things get complicated when you move from the page to the real world. Yeah, it's going to be like that. Now, he first starts off going into a study that shows how the US is not a true democracy, and that the government only cares about the inputs of the top 10%. It should be pointed out that this study has been very hotly debated by multiple sources, with general arguments being that the math isn't entirely correct, and that the middle class at least actually does have some level of input. However, the basic point that the US government mostly cares about special interests and lining their own pockets remains largely uncontested, so I won't dig further at that. Anyways, now I can finally get into the big meat of this refutation video, as we reach a second thoughts blaming of capitalism for all these problems caused by the state. You can choose to quit, but it'll take a lot to get you to that point, and this lets the capitalist make just about any decision they want. The same is true across the entirety of the economy. 
What dictates economic decisions are not the needs of the people whom the economy is both by and for, but the profit motive. If something horrible is profitable, even if everyone but a handful of elites oppose it, that horrible thing will continue. That's the case with fossil fuel extraction. At the same time, something that is necessary for millions of people may not happen at all if it isn't profitable. Like feeding everyone. Feeding the poor is never going to be as profitable as overproducing for the wealthy. While democracy seeks to even out the power among society and make sure that people aren't able to coerce one another into acting against their own interests, capitalism structures society into a hierarchy, with more money giving people more power over others, and therefore the ability to serve their self-interests and punish entire sections of the population far beyond what a democratic body would allow. Woo lad, that right there was an impressive amount of disinformation packed into a small amount of time. The first problem is, as I proved on a rational level in my video on my hierarchies, there is no such thing as truly abolishing hierarchies. Democracy does not get rid of hierarchies, but merely replaces the hierarchy by rule of majority. This allows A and B to vote to take away the rights of C, which is still a hierarchy, just rule of mob. And when socialists tell you that they are against hierarchies, what they really mean is that they are against the hierarchies they do not like. And you may have also noticed that Second Thought cited absolutely no economic data or any kind of evidence for anything he just said. I didn't see anything in the video description about this either, just the Princeton study, some citations, and some glove books about my democracy. That's not surprising since when we look at the evidence we find out that what he is saying is completely false in any economic sense. For instance, all profit means is that you provided more economic output than what you took in. And when based on voluntary exchange with society, this generally means you are providing good market value. Profit is a good thing, not a bad thing. It means you're providing value. We also see another quick example of the three-point drift of identify problem, blame capitalism, promote socialism, with him trying to blame capitalism for starvation. This is just flat out factually untrue. When we look at world data, the freer a country's market is, the less starvation it has. A huge example that really shows this to be the case is Japan. As an island nation, they lack the land necessary to farm for its entire 120 plus million population. And yet Japanese citizens are rated as highly unlikely to starve comparing to the rest of the world. Why? Because Japan has adopted a more free market model post-World War II, which allows them to trade the technology and other things their economy produces with countries that possess more farmland. This gives them the food they need to survive and feed their population. This is a mutually beneficial exchange and a perfect example that shows why profit is not a zero-sum game. What Second Thought is doing here is another very common reasoning error that you see from the far left. He's not comparing capitalism to less economically free societies as they actually exist or in history, but rather he is comparing them to a utopian ideal where scarcity is just magically dealt with and resources are fairly shared to whoever needs it the most as human beings in this utopian vision have apparently been replaced with omnibenevolent and omniscient angels who have no concept of praxology. Just read Tombstone, The Great Chinese Famine, if you are curious about the history and want to see what getting rid of capitalism actually accomplishes in terms of the nation's ability to feed itself. But for now, we'll move on to the next part of Second Thought's video. Ultimately then, capitalists are terrified of working people having as much power as they do. And luckily for them, the capitalist system isn't built to funnel money and power downwards. It's built to concentrate both in fewer and fewer hands. Whatever democracy may exist in some idealized, primitive capitalist system that libertarians love to talk about, will eventually be washed away by the mergers and acquisitions that centralize capitalist power. And there we have it, my monopolies. This is one of the most common straw men of the free market, which again is usually derived from more outcome bias that fails to understand the process that leads to it. There are multiple problems with this assertion. First off, there has never actually been an instance of natural monopoly forming outside the confines of government regulation. The second problem is that anything can be made to look like a monopoly depending on how you define the competition. This can be understood in a simple hypothetical scenario. Let's say you lived in a country where only one company makes motorcycles. Is this a monopoly? If you look at this from the perspective of building motorcycles and motorcycle market alone, sure. But if you look at it from the angle of the broader market of providing personal transportation, absolutely not. People can still buy cars, trucks, SUVs, and rocket-powered rollerblades or whatever, and so on and so forth. If this hypothetical motorcycle monopoly decided to exploit their stronghold in the motorcycle market, people would either opt for other modes of transportation, or perhaps one of the car companies or someone else might think, hey, motorcycle prices are really high right now due to demand. Perhaps we should start building and selling our own motorcycles. We could make bank. The result is that more motorcycles would enter the market, and the so-called monopoly would be lost. A much more in-depth rational explanation of this can be found at Mises on their article Fear of Monopoly. Edmund S. Bradley writes, 
the Microsoft Trials reminds us that the fear of industrial concentration is the last refuge of socialist theory. The claim is that capitalism ultimately fails because all, or most, at least some, industries naturally congeal into monopolies in a free market. It follows that governments must regulate industries to bring out competition. And he then goes on to prove why this simply isn't based on reality, using similar examples to the motorcycle scenario I just provided, along with further historical and rational evidence. But the third and biggest problem I have with Second Thought's attack on free market capitalism here is the simple reality that regulations by the government are far more likely to be used to create and defend legal monopolies than anything done to break them up. And we can see this again in history by the fact that the US government has gotten larger over time, and this increase coincides with the rise of consolidation into corporate monopolies along with regulations passed by the government which have also increased in number and scope over time. In other words, the evidence shows that our neoliberal mixed market that the Western society lives under has actually gotten further away from being a free market, not closer to it. So blaming free markets in this context for the concentration of power into a few megacorps makes absolutely no sense. If what Second Thought was saying was even remotely true, we should see the opposite relation. We should see a large government getting smaller as these corporations take control and deregulate the economy. But that is not what the data shows to be happening at all. The truth is that large corporations love the increase in government size, and they love the increase in regulations. And if you Google it, you can find numerous examples proving this to be the case and why it's the case. It's very common to see large businesses trying to get more regulations in place in order to raise the barrier to entry for their market in order to prevent competition or just otherwise regulate the competition away. Big tech giants like Facebook are actually one of them, as well as when Mattel used regulations against smaller toy makers. And Wall Street likes to get on on the action as well because if they know which winners and losers the state is choosing with these regulations, they can make their safer bets, adding another layer of perverse incentive for destroying small businesses with the threat of aggressive force. And yes, it absolutely is a threat of force that they are exploiting here. If you were to start a business in a market that has, say, $20,000 of regulatory fees, permits, and other hoops that the state wants you to jump through to be allowed to even start and compete, and you choose to just flat out ignore those fees and hoops, eventually the state will find out about it. They will start by sending you nasty, threatening letters and demanding you pay fines for non-compliance, and if you choose to ignore those letters, then eventually the state will send armed men to forcibly seize your business and take you to jail. It's important to understand that socialists not only do not provide any protection against this problem, but are actively encouraging it when they say things like, seize the means of production. They just sugarcoat it with utopian ideas of equality and fairness to trick you into not realizing what they're doing is really just condoning theft. This is also not just some fringe problem that only Austrian economists from the Mises Caucus have the guts to point out. You can find explanations for why big business loves regulation and big government on numerous think tanks, like the Adam Smith Institute or the Cato Institute and even Reason.com. All have articles explaining the problem of how regulation is the tool of big business to artificially increase their market share through, again, a system that uh, works on the back of the threat of force. So to blame any of this on the free market is to basically say free market is when the government regulates the economy, which is just by definition incorrect. From this we can come to understand what the more sensible solutions to government corruption are. We need to get government out of the market's way because the state clearly cannot be trusted to be a fair referee, as evidenced again by the fact that what they have done has resulted from these incentives to enrich themselves and the major corporations that they work with. Whether this means breaking the functions of the state up into several privately owned businesses and voluntary factions like what Mises suggests, or separation of state and economy like the Cato Institute suggests, or just a general reduction of the state's authority and power over the these regulations, like many others in various economic think tanks suggest, the general point is the same. You cannot fix a large corrupt organization, which all the evidence in this case points to it being the state, with more of that large corrupt organization. It's simply not going to work. Failing to understand this is like saying that in order to fix the problem that sometimes cops accept bribes to look the other way from violent offenses, that we must give the cops more power and take money away from the people so that they can no longer bribe the cops. Most rational people can probably understand why that would be an absolutely brain-dead solution because the cop is the one who has all the power and the monopoly on the use of force in this context, and is therefore the arbiter on whether or not to accept the bribe. Therefore, if anything, giving police more power in that case would likely just increase bribery, as a more empowered officer would have an easier time getting away with accepting bribes, and thus a greater incentive to be corrupt. 
Most people have no problem understanding that the power dynamics sit with the cop when imagining interactions between a state police officer and a private individual. But for whatever reason, socialists fail to realize that the same dynamics apply to the state and corporate lobbying. So if we truly wish to put the economic power back in the hands of the people, like Second Dot says, we need to first remove it from the hands of the state. But anyways, Second Thought continues on his sale with more socialism. At the end of the day, the most determinant aspect of our lives, the state of the economy, is left up to forces that we know will happily crush the needs and interests of the vast majority of the population to satisfy the greed of a well-positioned few. Our democracies are neither by the people nor for the people. They are by and for the capitalist class. But it doesn't have to be this way. By bringing the economy under democratic control, the pressures felt by everyday people in the workplace can be reduced. So long as there is scarcity, difficult decisions will need to be made, and we won't completely eliminate the everyday stress of human existence. But the artificial stress of creating surplus exclusively for a class of property owners, that we can get rid of. More generally, Governments could shift away from the parliamentary democratic model imposed on us centuries ago by slavers and landowners, and instead adopt a style of council democracy, or liquid democracy, to blend elements of representative government for those who prefer to temporarily delegate power, with more direct democracy elements for those who prefer to be involved. Workplaces could be run without management entirely, or with a group of managers directly elected by the workers. Constitutions could be drafted and approved by referendums of the general population, like is the case in Cuba and is starting to take shape in Chile. Positions within democratic institutions could be assigned by lottery, the way jury duty is, or by any number of other methods to ensure a more decent representation of the population. Central aspects of the economy could be planned or otherwise controlled to ensure that basic necessities are available to all. Positions of decision-making determined by lottery? Um, yeah, no, that is one of the silliest ideas I have ever heard. Decisions are best made on positions of merit. Deciding by lottery just means you could easily get some random fool who has no idea what they are doing, presiding over decisions that will almost certainly have a negative impact on people who do. I'm surprised I even have to point that one out. Other than that, what Second Thought just described there is really just a very sugar-coated version of socialism. And as I have been hinting at throughout this video, there is a very big problem with this solution. And that problem starts with the question, what does socialism actually do about the concentration of power? Well, hilariously enough, it gives it all to the state, thus creating an even bigger concentration of power into the hands of bureaucrats than what they accuse capitalism of doing. You see, when socialists try to sell you the idea of a workplace democracy, what they are often leaving out is the fact that this only makes sense under the context of the state forcibly stealing ownership from those businesses. It effectively means that the state now owns everything. Socialists are making the mistake of thinking that making it more democratic somehow changes the fact that it's still a monopoly. But this is not the case at all. Socialists are committing a crucial reasoning error, the belief that if they are participating in their slavery and get to choose their masters, then this somehow makes them free. In this sense, socialists are really just committing an extremely convoluted bandwagon fallacy, that if we all just decided to trust the communists and vote for this to happen, then it's magically a good and fair idea, and that it will somehow be free of corruption because they just say so, and that if we just voot for every economic decision, then those economic decisions must be rational ones, because hey, we vooted to run off the edge of a cliff, so off the edge of a cliff we go! Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You may have also noticed that Second Thought once again provided zero evidence at all that these proposed changes would be free of the same government corruption problem we already see with an even less complex form of government that we already have. When you remove all their fluff about for the people and mud democracy from the equation, what they are saying amounts to nothing more than the government is corrupt and the solution is government. And then they fool you by saying that we the people will be the ones in charge. Spoiler alert, that is not what happens when practice, we the people will not be in charge, and it never will happen. The people in charge of the social essential planning would end up being, ironically enough, the exact same people who are currently engaged in the very corrupt backroom deals that Second Thoughts videos are complaining about. You would live in the pod, you would own nothing, and you would not be happy. And most of the political establishment knows this. This is why BreadTube in general is not seen as a threat by the cathedral. Rather, just the opposite. They are regularly praised by mainstream state proxy media. Because these people ultimately do not pose any real ideological threat to the establishment's power, since their ideas ultimately will just result in a process that leads to them retaining that power. 
When we look at historical examples of socialist attempts to root out government corruption, they fail. For instance, North Korea claimed to have fixed its own private market corruption problem back with Kim Il-sung when North Korea was undergoing its Juche revolution. It has, um, not exactly worked out well for them. North Korea's totalitarian regime now just directly controls the businesses requiring them to meet quotas. Life for the North Korean people still lags behind the rest of the world. The two that Second Thought mentioned, Cuba and Chile, haven't exactly gotten anywhere either. The reality is that socialism has a track record of completely failing to do anything meaningful about government corruption, and no amount of socialist propaganda can ever cover this up. And you want to know the even harsher truth? Socialism doesn't even work in theory, not just in practice. To show why this is, I have done this episode of Refuting BreadTube as a collaboration with Liquid Zulu. Be sure to check out his video for an in-depth explanation for the impossibility of socialist theory and how it is logically doomed to failure every single time. But as far as I go, that's all for now. Feel free to like and subscribe and all that to see more of my content, and be sure to check out Liquid Zulu's video as well. Thanks for watching, till next time.